Wednesday webinar participants. So I'm super excited and I feel very honored to be able to be uh, the person speaking today, uh, especially because I get to talk about my favorite topic, which is native plants and talking about insects and their relationships with those native plants. And just like Shannon said, I am located out of Talbot County and I am the uh, horticulture educator and master gardener coordinator for Talbot County as well. You may have seen this slide before, but um, as you probably have seen from many other uh, speakers, we are an equal opportunity provider and we wanna make sure everybody knows uh, that you have equal access to all of the UMD programs and, um, and, and you should for any future program as well. All right, so these are the things I'm gonna to hope to cover today. And Shannon, I'm gonna rely on you to tell me if I need to like pick it up or wrap it up at the end, okay? Because sometimes I get excited about this topic, uh, but I'll try Sounds and keep good. it up. I'll keep us on task today. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what insect needs are, because in order to attract them and, and to keep them on properties, we need to kind of understand what they need. Um, and then we're going to talk about building better habits for better habitats. Uh, and then at the very end, I'm going to cover some recommended native plants. Um, and again, Shannon has the, uh, the copies of the slides, and she'll be able to send that out to everybody. So you don't need to frantically write down the list of things that I'm that I'm posting. You should have those lists uh, accessible afterwards. Okay, so pollinators uh, and insects require what every animal needs, right? And, and nature usually provides everything for pollinators, but we can help provide and construct environments that are more attractive or or attracts more of them um, to our sites. So they they require food and and in terms of flower, so a nectar and a pollen source. Um, other insects, uh, a lot of insects are predatory, or they required soft-bodied insects in order to um, in order to feed their young. We also talk about shelter, providing the right nesting sites and overwintering habitats. And I think that's one that often gets forgotten um, because they don't exactly die. At, I mean, many of them die at the end of the season, but many are overwintering and, and their future progeny are, are dependent on them being able to survive the winter. And then we're gonna look at freshwater sources, you know, surrounded by uh, brackish water on the Chesapeake Bay, um, doesn't always provide the same freshwater source that a lot of insects require, and it doesn't always provide an, an accessible water source. Uh, so just like in the picture on the right bottom, um, they often need like a landing space. So providing a bowl full of marbles and water or rocks and marbles like this, um, like that little bird bath, that actually provides them with a better landing site and more accessibility to that freshwater source. And then I'm gonna talk about the, the big one, habitat with layers. So you're planting things that have different heights, different flower shapes, different bloom times. These are all uh, really critical um, because just planting one species of native plant, well, that's that's great. It's a great start. Um, it doesn't provide them with season long interest or food source. And uh, a lot of our pollinators are what we call specialists. So they're tied to a certain group of plants or um, sometimes even a certain species, so like one plant that they're dependent on. So in order to attract a wide variety of insects, we need to provide that wide variety of plants as well. And I should say the freshwater source should be cleaned regularly um, so that you don't build up a mosquito breeding habitat, right? Just like a bird bath. So obviously uh, bees and butterflies, very charismatic and an appealing group um, to look at, but as, as the whole group, there's a lot of non-bee pollinators that we don't even really think about. Um, and this includes flies, moths, beetles are a big one actually, um, even wasps and ants. And uh, in some rare cases, animals like birds and bats as well. And these are huge contributors uh, and very important to the global crop pollination. And, and in fact, I think the last study I looked at perform these animals perform 25 to 50 percent of the total number of flower visits made, um, which, you know, the honeybee and, and butterflies, they get all the attention, but it's not just about them. Right. So we can't forget about attracting these other pollinators that are very important. OK, so how can we have habits for better habitats? So all these things 
they can start at home. Uh, they can start in your backyard. You can translate them um, to fields if you're interplanting in fields and things like that. But even just a little bit goes a long way. So these are things that anybody is capable of doing as long as you have um, some space to grow things, right? So what I like to focus on is plant and season variety. I have a nice slide coming up that shows you how to kind of plant for different seasons. Um, and, you know, I, I talk a lot about native plants, not just because I like them, because, because there's a lot of studies that show um, native plants being so beneficial to a wider variety of insects and populations. Um, and mostly we want to avoid the use of invasive plants, right? So these are things that push out all of uh, these other native plants or sometimes even um, other species and they they kind of bully the area and, and then other things aren't able to grow and then we lose a lot of that biodiversity. And if you can, avoiding pesticide use in these foraging or habitat areas. And again, this is, this is if it's possible. Um, so again, everybody is capable of being able to make a little bit of change for the good. So here's a good example, a good example um, of plants that bloom over a wide variety of seasons and times. So you want to use plants um, that are herbaceous perennials, but sometimes what we find is a lot of the most beneficial early spring plants are actually these at the bottom, the shrubs and trees, because the herbaceous perennials haven't come up out of the ground yet, right? So they, they aren't really blooming in the very early seasons, but the woody plants like hawthorns, red buds, um, you know, cherry trees, these are the things that provide the early season flowering. Um, and especially as things are warming up, that's when bees uh, start to forage. A lot of our early season bees will start to forage and they need a, a source of pollen and nectar. And again, having that variety of different plant types and colors and flower shapes is super beneficial as well, because here in Maryland, I think we have over, what is it, 430 species of native bees alone. Um, I'm not just talking about the other non-bee pollinators. And many of those, I think 28% of those bees are specialist feeders. So if they don't have um, you know, their plant of choice available in the landscape, um, you won't see them. So uh, to, to support a wide variety of insects, which is a healthy ecosystem, by the way, we wanna make sure that we are incorporating a lot of variety into the landscape. And this is a chart that was found through the Xerxes Society. And, and I have that linked in the resources if you're interested. Okay, other things they need, just like humans, they need a house, they need shelter. Um, so providing a variety of nesting grounds, um, bees and many other beneficial insects, they all require the different nesting sites. So sometimes um, it's decomposing plant matter or undisturbed soil. Um, native bees are either what we call eusocial or solitary. So they do not nest in large colonies like we typically think of. You know, honeybees are social insects, so they have a hive, they have a colony, but all of our other native bees are pretty much solitary. Um, and I use this picture as an example of a eusocial uh, bee, which is a bumblebee. So these queens will all nest near each other and raise their progeny nearby, but they don't necessarily have a, a social hierarchy like the honeybee does. So um, a lot of our solitary bees are also not interested in stinging humans or even being close to us. Um, and in fact, many of them cannot sting at all. Um, so I don't want anybody to be afraid of attracting more bees uh, because they are even more docile than, than you might think. Um, some other things that are really beneficial is leaving snags or dead wood. And that's if it's safe, you know, if, if people are walking under it or, um, you know, a structure isn't at risk. Um, but if you have the ability to leave some dead wood, this is a really popular thing for a lot of beetles in particular. And I'll talk about why beetles are kind of important in a little bit. Um, but even brush or rock piles um, can be really beneficial. And even the stems. So um, I believe it's 30% of our native bees are what we call cavity dwelling. So they nest in holes, uh, they could be in wood or in stems of a lot of plants is where they end up nesting. And this is where they also overwinter. So 
you know, what I like to say is a lot of people cut back all of their perennials at the end of the season, like in, in the fall. And this is the worst time to cut them back because that all of those native bees are overwintering in the stems of those plants. And so if you remove them from the property or from the location, um, they don't have a chance to emerge in the spring and then you, you've, you've lost your population. And here's some more examples of uh, different bee habitats that you can create. I really like the stump on the right because I never know what to do with a stump from a tree after it's fallen down. Um, but if you cut it kind of up high, um, you can actually just drill holes in it. And a lot of our cavity dwelling mason bees um, will take up residence in those holes. And uh, you can create kind of like a little natural bee hotel. I also think it looks kind of sculptural and it and it kind of breaks up the garden a little bit, but you can make it look really attractive. Um, you know, the, the thing on the left is constructed out of cut bamboo. This is a great activity to do with kids. Um, we'll do it in elementary schools and with and with other youth groups, um, but super easy. And then, you know, at the end of the season or after they've been used by the bees, you can dispose of them. Um, so, you, you know, the, there's a lot of different ways to incorporate um, habitat and shelter for, for insects. Okay, again, I know I talked a little bit. So the, I said the 30% of bees are cavity nesting. The other 70% are ground nesting. Um, so they tunnel uh, underground or they have underground chambers or they're in the leaf litter like we saw with the bumblebees a couple of slides ago. And then of course, a lot of beetles rely on undisturbed soil. One beetle that comes to mind is of course the lightning bug. Um, these are creatures that take almost two years um, from the time that they're larva through pupation. And so um, during that two year time, they need undisturbed soil. So if we're doing a lot of tilling or disturbance, um, we lose, we can lose those populations of lightning bugs. Um, and those larvae in particular are also voracious predators. So they're eating other things in the soil like slugs and other like tiny soft bodied insects. Um, so again, this is just a good reminder that even just a little bit of bare ground um, isn't a bad thing because of course, ground nesting insects um, need to burrow or, and they need spots in order to, uh, to dig in. And this is, these are locations where they're gonna be overwintering as well. And of course I talked about cavity nesting. So we'll, we'll go on to this slide, just an example of um, some cavity nesting bees in a stem, in a hollow stem. So it's a cute little bee butt that we see on the left. Um, but then there's this infographic on the right that I think is really helpful in visualizing um, how they use the stems of plants uh, over the course of many seasons and how it's beneficial to leave them, when to sort of cut them, um, and at what stage we're seeing those bees in development. Because of course they go through um, the egg stage, the larval stage, and then they pupate into an adult. And sometimes you'll even see um, like in the stems, the bees will cap the end with maybe um, some mud or or they'll, they'll just plug it so that it sort of protects uh, the eggs that are underneath. So you can sometimes even tell what, what stems are being occupied because once they emerge that that plug of uh, mud will kind of disappear you know they'll they'll pop out of it and there will be a hole. And I find this really interesting. Again, there's that um, little mud cap that we see on the end of the bamboo on the right, but on the left is a cross section of how carpenter bees pupate. Um, and carpenter bees are the big ones, right? So the ones that are really intimidating um, because they're large, but they're very harmless. They're just really terrible flyers. So they kind of bumble around, um, but this is how their chambers look. Um, so they'll actually dig quite a ways in and lay their eggs in different chambers. And you can even see, they'll, they'll pack those chambers with um, bee bread, which is basically chewed up pollen. And that's what we see. Let me get my pointer out here. So this is the bee bread, um, which is basically just that chewed up pollen. And that's what uh, the larvae feed on um, before they can turn, they can pupate. And this is a near, nearly finished pupating um, carpenter bee. But here's the, here's the larva on the left. I know it's kind of gross looking, but it's also very fascinating to think about um, these different life stages and, and how they build their, their habitat. 
Uh, and you may see this on Facebook a lot, um, this message about leaving the leaves. Um, and there are a few exceptions to this rule, you know, especially when we talk about um, trees that have like disease or foliar disease issues, you know, then sanitation kind of takes more precedence. But um, leaving the leaves is, is a multifold beneficial practice, not just for um, improving soil health, but there's a lot of critters that overwinter in leaf litter. I don't know, can you can you spot the critter on the left? It's, it's kind of hard to see, but this is actually a red bat. Um, and they will sometimes roost in trees or, the, or they'll hang in, in like loblolly trees, but sometimes they, they fall into the leaf litter um, and, and they'll still be hibernating. And so they'll be hiding in some of this leaf litter. And so a lot of our, our native red bats um, you don't even realize are, are down there in the leaf litter on the ground. And here's another important one. Um, this is the cocoon of a giant silk moth. This happens to be the Luna moth, but it is a large group of, uh, of moth family that use leaves in order to uh, disguise their pupa and to disguise uh, their cocoon. And um, it, you know, it, it's a shame to think about removing all of those leaf, leaves and possibly removing a lot of these giant moths as well. And then of course, I, I gave the example of the bumblebees. Bumblebees are also those, those ground nesting um, insects and they rely on leaf litter in order to survive winter because it acts as a buffer. Of course, it's kind of like a blanket, right? So if you peeled away all of those leaves, um, there's nothing to protect them from the elements. Um, so, you know, this this is a not only a, a good buffer, but then those leaves break down relatively quickly and provide uh, a healthier soil structure as well. And this is a little, little bit different, but I like talking about it because I think it's a really um, interesting concept is beetle banks. So these are mounded soil rows, um, and it's usually in terms of um, agricultural practices, but I don't see why you can't have beetle banks in your in your backyard or at home either. Um, so these are undisturbed habitat refuge for predatory beetles. And that's an example of one on the right. Those those black beetles, um, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. A lot of these ground beetles are, are really good predators. They're fast um, and they, they eat a lot of the soft bodied insects that are, are normally pests on our plants. Um, but these beetle banks are usually planted with uh, mixed with native plants or even just bunch grasses. So a lot of native grasses as well. Um, so again, the beetle banks utilize native perennial bunch grasses, but you, you can also include a lot of wildflowers in order to attract uh, both pollinators and to make it more attractive for you as well. Um, but, it, you know, I use the lightning bug as kind of a reference. A lot of beetles require multi-year process in order to complete their life cycle. So that's why I emphasize um, undisturbed habitat as being pretty cr critical. And of course, using pesticides around these beetle banks is, is discouraged. You can use them adjacent maybe, but um, you know, otherwise it's harmful to the these habitats where they um, take refuge. So here's a cross section um, or a berm, you know, a mounded bank. These these I think are just to improve drainage and so that it's not just sitting wet because of course, if it's sitting wet or there's too much water, you're not gonna get any beetle activity. You you know, things don't wanna pupate in um, soaked soil. Um, but this might not be necessary with soils that are well-drained. Um, and you'll also notice that they can be furrowed linearly with crop rows in a field, uh, but they are not tilled or disturbed. Uh, so this is a true example of like interplanting. Um, and that's because the plants in here are used as, as perennial. And again, they're left undisturbed uh, sometimes for years. Here's a, a, a life, a real life example of a beetle bank in the field. Um, so that these actually become refuge, not only just for beetles, but for other insects um, that are pupating and pollinating in the fields as well. It gives them kind of a break. All right. And so this is the hard one. This is, you know, this is me trying to uh, convince um, the public and other people that, um, you know, we can make behavior changes that are super beneficial, starting with leaving the leaves. Um, you know, we talked about not cutting back the perennials and why that's important. Um, if you're going to do a planting, 
you know, aiming for a ratio of 70% native plants to 30% ornamental plants. This is like a, a scientifically backed study that shows that is like an optimum level of benefits for insect activity. Um, any more native plants than 70% is great, but this is this is like the golden ratio apparently. Um, and it's also okay to be lazy. Uh, you know, you don't have to remove all of those leaves off the property. Um, I'm giving you permission to say it's for the pollinators, right? Um, so anytime, you, you know, you're leaving those uh, leaves or, or you're not cutting things back, it's not because you just couldn't get to it. Um, it it's because you're doing it for a purpose. You know, it's, it is actually beneficial. And when you can, if it's possible, using turf alternatives. Um, I like to pick on uh, turf grass a lot because it is a monoculture that we um, maintain regularly. And there's a lot of turf area uh, that could be beneficial if we turned it over to something like a native garden. Um, so just even thinking about, you know, a 10 foot square place uh, that's turf and turning that over to something that's native. And you would be amazed at the amount of activity um, that you'll notice even in a small location like that. Um, it's kind of like the field of dreams, right? If you plant it, they will come. It's so true. All right. And I'm going to move on to uh, recommended native plants. So what do I suggest for people who are trying to attract more insects into the landscape? So I talk a lot about plants with pithy stems. So these are stems that um, are either easy to, to chew out or they're already hollow. And that's because, again, if you want to see those um, cavity dwelling bees, uh, these are the plants they tend to, to do that activity in. So there's raspberries, which raspberries are also a really high pollinator plant. So um, that's beneficial on, on many sides. Um, elderberries, joe pie weeds are a really great um, source for pollinators as well in bloom, much less their stems, which are very hollow and they're quite, quite large. Um, marsh hibiscus, switch grasses. Um, a lot of these native grasses, uh, the, the grasses are hollow inside. And because we have so many different sizes of bees, um, you know, a lot of these plants will vary in terms of diameter of, of, the, of the stem. What I don't want people to plant <laughs> is invasive plants like bamboo, even though we use cut bamboo uh, or dead bamboo for, for activities and projects. Um, I don't encourage the use of, of planting it. Um, and the same goes for Japanese knotweed or princess tree. These are both notoriously hollow stemmed plants, but they're super invasive. So, uh, and if you ever have any question about whether a plant is invasive or not, or you're debating the merits of planting it, I always encourage people to reach out to me because um, I talk native plants all day long and I'm happy to discuss uh, plant choices with anyone. All right, so, and if we look at native plants that give the most, what I call the bang for your buck, um, this is a great list to start with. These are uh, plants that I kind of solicited through many different books, um, you know, in terms of their activity with uh, insects. So one list is native bee interactions. These five plants have like the highest interactions with uh, native bee populations. And then the top five plants on the right are predatory wasp interactions. And now I don't want people to pull away because again, most of our native wasps are solitary. They're not interested in humans. They aren't going to sting you. They're more interested in hunting for prey. Um, and that's where we can use them because they're very good at going after those uh, pest insects that we don't like to see so much. Um, and you'll notice sort of a theme with these. So a lot of, um, a lot of things in the mint family. When in doubt, a lot of mint plants tend to uh, be very beneficial for a wide range of plants. It's what we call generalist plants. Um, so again, uh, aster families or uh, plants from the aster family are also really beneficial. Um, and keep in mind, a lot of uh, these plants should also be late season blooming because this is a very critical time for insects to start uh, gathering nectar and pollen in order to make it through diapause, which is insect hibernation. Um, the only plant on this list that is not Mar uh, Maryland native is purple prairie clover. It's native to the Midwest, but honestly, it's one of the coolest plants and one of the coolest flowers I've ever seen. So I like to encourage people to plant it anyways, because um, it is a really neat plant. 
So you'll notice uh, goldenrod is on this list. Uh, a lot of milkweeds, a lot of mints, um, and sunflowers. We have quite a few native sunflowers, and those are another good one that is um, beneficial to a wide range of insects. So it's not just for specialist insects, it's for a wide range. And this is just an example of um, a few of our native bees or native insects that you might find if you uh, plant some of these things. This is my favorite bee of all time. It's called the longhorned bees. And um, these are a group of male bees that will get together. They're, they like have a bachelor's club. They'll actually clasp the stem of flowers to sleep at night. Um, because again, most, most bees are solitary. Um, and they don't know what to do with themselves, so they just kind of gather at night. Um, and if that's not the cutest thing you've ever seen, then I don't know what to tell you. Um, but and, and then this plant on the right is actually swamp milkweed, and it's it's probably more notorious for supporting um, monarch activity. But we shouldn't discredit the amount of other insects that also visit milkweeds. So we see a leaf cutter bee here. It has a really big head. Um, really large mandibles for cutting, you know, cutting leaves out to make their, actually they use it to line their nests or their cavities. And then a bumblebee here on the bottom. And then the, these two plants on the bottom are both mountain mint. Um, and if you want a plant that will have just about any insect you've ever seen, plant mountain mint because it's, it's a huge attractor for a wide variety of insects, including this four-toothed mason wasp. So this is a, um, we call it a potter wasp too. They'll actually gather mud and um, and they'll make their nests out of mud and then pack them with like dead spiders for their young. I know that sounds kind of gross, but it's just a reminder that wasps are actually really beneficial. Um, they're really good hunters and they're fast. And then of course the goldenrod beetle, uh, an example of a beneficial beetle pollinator that is also not only a good pollinator, um, it's also a really good predator or the larvae are good predators of other insects. And you probably have seen those before, um, you know, like maybe early summer, um, you'll you'll see them all over the place and they'll be breeding all over the place. They look super annoying, but they're actually very, very helpful. All right, and these are some other um, plant recommendations, both perennials and, and a lot of these are annuals as well. Um, so even if you're not exactly sold on the native plant train, um, there's a lot of non-natives that provide a, a huge variety of, of benefits as well, including um, dill, carrot, parsley, fennel. These are all hosts for the black swallowtail butterfly, which I'll talk about in the next slide a little bit. Um, but again, the carrot family is a, is a good producer, the mint family, the legume family, and the aster family. Those are like the four um, big groups that we should be pulling plants from. Um, in order to you know support the widest variety of insects. And, and that's because um, a lot of these flowers are very small. So that makes it very accessible um, to pretty much any insect because insects come in a wide variety of sizes. Um, but if you think about like having a really long tubular flower, there's only certain bees or insects that are able to access the nectar because they have to have either a long tongue um, or, or some kind of adaptation in order to reach the nectar. If the flower is small, it's very easy to get to. It's like the low hanging fruit, right? It's the, it's the low hanging um, flowers. And then of course, um, you know, I touched briefly about specialist relationships. So these are insects that are, are highly dependent on um, one flower sometimes or one group of plants in order to complete its life cycle. Um, monarchs are the classic example of a specialist relationship. And these are all um, butterflies, by the way. Um, I, I could have I had a much longer list, but these are specifically butterflies. Um, so again, you know, in order to get monarchs, you're going to have to have milkweed. And, and that's not to say the adult will not feed on other flowers. Of course, they'll sip ne nectar from anywhere. Um, but the larval stage, the caterpillar, must feed on milkweed. Um, and, and they're one of the few insects that are able to tolerate milkweeds because of they have um, this latexy, uh, milky sap that nothing else can eat. Um, so they're, you know, they're adapted to feed just on milkweeds. And uh, black swallowtail butterfly is probably another one that gets mistaken for monarchs a lot. Um, 
but they are exclusive feeders on the carrot family. So carrot, dill, fennel, if you want the black swallowtail butterfly, plant those things because they will find it. Um, and, and they're a real joy to, to kind of watch, especially if you have children in, in, at your house or anything like that. They just love the caterpillars. Um, and then a lot of these are, are some of my favorites, but you'll, you'll notice that there are certain groups of plants that you need to have in order to get these butterflies. So here's my classic example. Um, here's, here's the adult monarch feeding on verbena, which is another great um, perennial native, but then here's our caterpillars feeding just on the milkweed. And um, you know, plant a healthy crop of milkweed because there's a lot of insects that actually feed on milkweed, including the red milkweed beetle. Um, and there's another caterpillar, the milkweed tussock moth, which also um, appears about this time of year and they also only will feed on the milkweeds. And then this is actually a uh, swamp milkweed on the left, but we have quite a few native milkweeds like the common one that's usually found on the roadsides and then a uh, butterfly weed, which is the orange flowered one. So you might be more familiar with seeing that in like a, like a landscape situation. Um, but swamp milkweed is, is another one that is great for like wet soils because butterfly weed does not grow well in wet areas. So I like to say there's there's a native plant for every situation, for every growing condition. Okay, and um, so here's my last example. These are uh, fritillaries, variegated fritillary probably one of the most attractive caterpillars and chrysalises I've ever seen in my life. And in real life, these are as iridescent as they look. So they're actually shiny. It almost looks like a craft project, like, like a kid threw glitter on it or something. Um, they don't look real, but they are real. They're native. Um, and they feed pretty exclusively on yellow, like yellow passion flower, but they'll also feed on may apples, which are very common around this area. And then of course, here's the, um, Here's the butterfly or the adult on the bottom. And I think it's feeding on poop, <laughs> which I never noticed before. Um, but butterflies do do that. Um, but this caterpillar is, is one of the coolest looking things I've ever seen. And it's not um, it's not a stinging caterpillar. But, you know, I, I always discourage people from touching it with their hands just in case you're, you're not sure about identification. Um, but just another really classic example of why it's nice to incorporate these native plants so that you get these unique specialist feeders um, in the landscape. All right. And as I'm wrapping up here, um, you know, I, I just, this is to help me gauge whether the information I've been sharing today has been helpful or if you've learned anything about it, if you feel free to drop into the chat box, um, your agreement with this statement, which is, you know, after listening to me talk about native plants and planting for pollinators today, you feel more knowledgeable, one being strongly disagree and five meaning you would strongly agree with that statement. And I'm sorry, because I know that's going to flood the chat box, Shannon, so it might make your job harder. Um, okay. But I will, I will leave this up for a little bit. These are a lot of the resources I referenced and certainly this would be really beneficial beyond my talk today. Um, and I encourage anybody interested to, to check these out. I have found them to be super useful, um, but I'm also available as a resource. And so with that, maybe we can, um, we can move on to questions. I don't know if there are any in the chat box. Absolutely. I, I don't see, and there was a couple comments. Um... Don't see any questions yet. That must mean I covered everything perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I love the photos. They was great. They were great. Oh my goodness! And and I gotta tell you, like ninety percent of my photos are just from my front yard. Um, you know, I don't have to go very far sometimes to find cool stuff, and that's just a it's a good example of what you can do in your backyard or your front yard, and and what you can see. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do see a question about, um, yep. um, is there an acceptable plant we can plant instead of bamboo? Um, I guess my question would be, what would be your intent and purpose in using bamboo? Like if you're using it as a privacy screen, there's actually a whole page on the Home and Garden Information Center um, that lists good privacy. Oh, perfect. Um, well, what you can do, Kristen, is I'm happy to look that link up real quick. 
um, and I can drop it in the chat box. Just hold on a second. I don't know. And if there are any other questions that are coming up, And yeah, I think, you again, getting... um, you know, in use for a privacy screen, um, you want to make sure that you're using a mix of both um, height and of different kinds of plants. So evergreen and um, and deciduous, because those are going to be super helpful uh, to make sure that you have that variety, as well as it won't look odd if like one plant dies, because um, that's what I find with privacy screens that are planted in like a row, you want to make sure you have a good mix so you aren't seeing um, anything look really glaringly wrong. All right, I have the link, hold on. And somebody asked about carpenter bees eating unpainted wood on houses. Um, you know, I and and I understand that because I I struggle with carpenter bees as well, and and they are they're a beneficial pollinator, uh, but I realize that they're also um, a nuisance for a lot of homeowners. I mostly used the carpenter bee as an example because it's a very large insect, um, so that photo it's a little bit easier to see how they structure their chambers because there's a lot of other bees. Um, that do a similar thing. So they'll actually build their chambers back and lay their eggs in each chamber. Um, but, you know, they they will take up residence in something that's that's large enough for them. I think that's mostly the problem is that they're looking for um, big dead wood or big, uh, big trees that have come down. And that's where they would take residence if our houses and our sheds were not available, right? All right. Do we have any other questions? If not, um, again, I'm going to put my email up on the screen in case anybody wants to send me an email. Um, I'm happy to talk about native plants, insects, uh, any any other pollinator questions. Um, somebody's asking about how to find bagged leaf litter without pesticides. Um, I would say it's probably very unlikely those leaves have pesticides in them unless you know the trees have been treated. So a lot of like crepe myrtles uh, have been treated for uh, crepe myrtle bark scale. So they'll use a systemic for that. I don't think you would find it in the leaf litter itself. Um, but generally, um, most people are not treating their trees because it's a very expensive practice. So it's it'd be very unusual. But really, the only way to make sure is to just use whatever is on your property or um, you know, a good friend where you know their practices and you know they haven't been treating. So uh, a lot of people you will find are interested in getting rid of their leaves. Um, so it might just bear asking, you know, do have, have you treated any of these for any pest problems or anything like that? But most people are not applying any foliar treatments to large mature trees just because it's, it's not economical. It's not, um, you know, it's not a good idea. But it's a good question. Oh, and I'm sorry, April, I do not know what is planted beside the Agricultural Library at College Park. Um, but I'm sure if you ask somebody, especially in the plant science building, they would definitely be able to tell you. All right, Shannon, do we have, if we don't have any other questions? We do not. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you, Michaela. And thank you to everyone that shared your lunch hour with us. Um, hope you learned more. We will be sending out the recording and the slide set. So thank you again. And um, next, we have uh, two more webinars scheduled this year, one in October and one in November. So thank you again. All right. Thanks so much, Shannon.